Welcome to Engenomics, I'm Hank, and today we're going to be going over a new series that I'm calling Future or Farce, in which I'm going to be looking at technology that I think is really interesting or maybe just a little overhyped. So I want to welcome you to this series, and today we're going to be looking at 3D printed cars. This is a really cool technology that a lot of companies are claiming is right within our reach, but honestly, I'm not too convinced and I'm a little skeptical. So let's dive into a couple examples of that. I recently discovered two extremely interesting videos on this subject, the first of which was released in 2015 by Local Motors. Just to up my credibility a bit further, I have recently purchased an Ender 3 Pro 3D printer, which prints in the same manner as this car. A hot end extrudes PLA plastic precisely in three axes. It's super cool for small models and proof of concepts, but wildly impractical for large scale automotive manufacturing. Honestly, this first video isn't that exciting to me based on the fact that from this video, what it looks like is a giant Ender 3 Pro, the version that I have. It's not that exciting because this is some pretty proven technology and isn't exciting because it's not hugely scalable. This is the equivalent of taking the design of a little tight car, throwing it into a giant 3D printer, and then just sticking random regular parts into it. It's not that exciting for me. Now that that one's out of the way, we can focus in on the Singer 21C, which in Top Gear's video is titled the world's first 3D printed hypercar. This is the Zinger 21C. You won't have heard of it because it's a brand new car from a brand new company, but it's on a mission to change everything. In there is the world's only climate controlled additive manufacturing facility. Basically it's the big room where they do all the 3D printing. And the big news here is that they can produce aluminium printed parts now at the same rate that they can produce cast aluminium parts, which means price parity and that's the big breakthrough. Okay, first of all, claiming that you can 3D print aluminum parts at the same rate that you can cast them is kind of crazy. Let's go over what casting is. Real quick for the unfamiliar, metal casting is a common method of manufacturing for most metals. It is done by having a cast sample and surrounding it with usually sand to make a mold. Once holes are made, molten metal can be poured into the mold and then let briefly to cool. The framework and sand is then removed to reveal the part inside. This process is used from everything from engine blocks to bathtubs and is relatively cheap for the parts, but more on that later. Metal 3D printing on the other hand is in its technological infancy. The machines that carry out can cost millions of dollars and require special installations. As the filament, metal is used for 3D printing, but you can't just melt down an aluminum can and stick the molten aluminum into the printer. Special aluminum powder is used layer by layer joined with a process known as sintering. In its current state, the process can produce up to 100 cubic centimeters per hour, which is 100 milliliters per hour, even though new prototypes are capable of tripling these rates. It's a small price to pay for being able to manufacture any shape your heart and CAD software abilities are capable of. But going back to the video, I think it's just absurd to claim that one, you're able to 3D print parts at the same rate that you're gonna be casting them, and two, that the cost is gonna be the same. That said, that all depends on the scale of production. And over here, this is the big breakthrough on the manufacturing side. It's called the automated unit. It's basically a 15 meter by 15 meter space in which you can build up to 100,000 chassis a year. Based on this claim that it can produce 10,000 cars a year, that's 1.14 cars an hour in that 15 by 15 space alone. I'm a little skeptical about this, but it's kind of an interesting thing nonetheless. The problem here is gonna be the programming of these huge mechanical arms, because if you were to build thousands of custom vehicles, it's gonna be extremely difficult to precisely and reliably program these robots to do that. While you might wanna technologically compare this to Tesla, which in 2019 produced just over 367,000 cars, you should really compare it to other luxury automotive brands like Rolls-Royce, who hit their peak number of sales in 2018 with a number of 4,107 cars. And like Rolls-Royce, these are likely to be highly customizable luxury cars. So I get it. The point I wanna show you is just how much of this car is actually 3D printed. So this, for example, is 3D printed aluminum. And you can see it just bolts together with other sections that lead into these straight aluminum extrusions. So back to 3D printed aluminum, this piece looks amazing. It's beautiful. But one question I have is why would you 3D print it 
rather than use a more traditional way of manufacturing it? Well, Zinger's answer might be only one word. I get that they want to break the mold. Get it? They're literally breaking the mold. They're literally not using molds for this. You really need to look at economies of scale. Economies of scale are cost advantages experienced when a production becomes efficient, as costs can be spread over a larger amount of goods. With casting, the price of producing a mold is expensive up front, but once made, can be used over and over again to produce the same part efficiently, which saves money. With 3D printing, no mold is needed, but the more expensive aluminum powder and slower manufacturing time, the cost goes up comparatively. While this solution may be good for a hobby shop producing a couple hundred cars a year, it is inconceivable for a larger manufacturing such as Ford or Toyota to even think about using this. That is until the costs and print times improve in the future. Come up here and then things start to get a bit more complicated. So these things are called nodes and you'll see they're joined together by just these straight standard carbon fibre poles. Again, affordable, easy to work with. While I agree that using standard rolls of carbon fibre is a lightweight and affordable solution, it's laughable that this guy keeps touting the scalability and affordability of these parts, when in actuality they're going into a $1.7 million supercar. What I want to demonstrate here is, this is, if you like, three generations of the same components. So this one here, was designed over the course of about three weeks by a team of human beings. And finally, we have this, which is the latest iteration of the same part. So basically, it's got the same hard points, but this has been designed in two minutes by a computer. I have to commend Zinger for this because these parts are absolutely gorgeous. And I truly believe this process called generative design is the future of everything. This is completely done by a computer program in which you put the forces that are going to be acting on the part and the footprint you want it to take up. This gives 3D printing a huge advantage because you can severely cut down on the material needed to make the part. And if we come around the front, this bumper section here is a really interesting component because it looks like normal aluminium, but this is all 3D printed and inside it is a really complicated organic waffle honeycomb structure, whatever you want to call it, that's been designed by a computer and optimized to absorb crash loads. The bumper here is super cool, especially if it accomplishes what it claims. That said, I'm going to go back to my previous questions for the other parts. Why would you use 3D printing rather than a traditional method of manufacturing? This huge printed aluminum bumper looks like it could potentially cost thousands of dollars. So what advantages does it have over, say, a standard plastic bumper? Interestingly, this car is supposedly quite hard to write off because if you crash into a tree, you're probably going to bend the whole chassis and you need to replace the whole thing. But because it's modular, if this is the only bit that's damaged, well, you can replace that. And then you've got these aluminium extrusions and then you've got a different section here. So with any luck, there's only a bit of the car that you need to stick back on. Remember earlier when I said that cast aluminum uses molds? Well, those molds need to be physically stored and maintained if they are to be used again. Sure, it doesn't seem like a big deal until you multiply that over potentially thousands of parts in dozens of models for decades of years. That adds up quickly and entire warehouses can be filled with these molds. So being able to store the design on a hard drive rather than a shelf in a warehouse is a huge advantage. Also, let's say that your car had a mechanical failure and you needed a replacement part quickly. If you were to send in for the manufacturer to give you a part, that could potentially take weeks of shipping. But say you could just go into your auto parts store, they would have the design there, the exact part that you needed, and 3D print it right before your very eyes. That's a super exciting future in my opinion. The rest of the car is more of the same. And then they talk with the founder and CEO, Kevin Zinger. And he seems to really care about the artistry and technology behind this vehicle, which actually is a huge thing that I respect. He's really about the customization and optimization, and I really believe that technology like the 3D printing and especially the generative design are gonna define the 21st century. This guy is really ahead of his time, even if this technology isn't there right now. And with a $1.7 million price tag, the Zinger 21C isn't going to be in your driveway anytime soon. That said, I really hope that the technology that is in this car will inspire a lot of other automotive and other manufacturers to use this technology in the future. That's all for today. Thanks again for watching, and if you could like and subscribe, that would be really great and that would help me out a lot. 
I'm trying to establish more of a weekly upload schedule, but no guarantees because I'm going to be doing some traveling and the holidays are coming up pretty soon. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye!